school of ministry. Men of God, students, believers who are hungry for a move of God in these last days. I want to welcome you today to a very, very important strategic school of ministry. The mandate of God on my life is to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. The Spirit of God laid it by heart to put together this one-week school of ministry as the years rounding up for ministers of the gospel, for believers, and for people who are hungry to be used and equipped by God in these last days. Our mandate is simple, to reintroduce Jesus to this generation. Now through this one week of teachings every day, you will hear teachings that will equip you with an understanding of some basic principles of Bible interpretation, an understanding of the message, the message of, of Christ as the central theme of the Bible, and an understanding of what we call the ministry of the New Testament. This is going to be very, very, very explosive. Let me warn you ahead of time. There are things we are going to be learning and going to be preaching and teaching in the course of this online school of ministry that will go against religion, that will go against the norm, and that will go against religious practices. I'm warning you ahead of time. My advice is simple. Keep your mind open. Keep your mind simple. Make notes. Take scriptures down. When the teaching is over, pray in the spirit. Go back through the notes again with an open mind as you seek for revelation knowledge in the light of Christ. You know, if the Bible was just as straight as it looks, there would be no need for Brother Paul to ask Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. So if the scriptures must be rightly divided, that means it's not just as straight as it looks. There are principles with which we interpret the scriptures and divide the scriptures. So I'd like you to have an open mind. And just before we go in, I'm going to pray for you. But I want to advise you to help us. Invite a friend, invite another minister of the gospel somewhere else. And if you're in a city where this message is not known, invite other ministers of the gospel in your city. The more people we can reach through this online school of ministry, the better for us. It's free. We're not charging you no fees. The burden and the vision in my heart is to see the message of Christ envelop the earth as the water covers the sea. You're going to get these teachings through the week. And at the end of the teaching tonight, I'll be back again with some information that will help you. But let's pray together before we go right into the teaching session for the first day. And Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to learn, to be equipped. I want to pray for every student that has registered onto this online school of ministry, that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light. That you be strengthened with might in the inner man. That Christ dwells in your heart by faith. That you be rooted and grounded in love. That you comprehend with all saints what is the width, the length, the breadth, and the depth of the love of God. That puts it all understanding. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I come against religion. I come against tradition. I pull down strongholds in the mind. And I command the glorious light of the gospel to shine in the hearts of your people. I decree that this one week will be life transforming. This one week will be a week of transitioning from the old to the new. Thank you for new wine skins with new wine. Raised out of this online school of ministry the next few days. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. We love you, friends, and we're just going to go right into the teaching of God's word. And at the end, I'll be back to share some information with you. Enjoy the class. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Thou hast known the holy scriptures. The word holy scriptures is the Greek word for hagios graphe. Thou hast known the hagios graphe. Hagios graphe in the Greek means sacred writings or set apart writings. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures or the hagios graphe, which are able to make thee wise. The holy scriptures or the sacred writings are able to make thee wise unto salvation. 
the mission of the scriptures is to bring you to a place of wisdom in the subject of salvation to make thee wise unto salvation unto the mission of the scriptures to make you wise unto salvation because the entire framework of the gospel is salvation Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The entire mission of the gospel is to bring people to a place called salvation. In the book of Romans chapter 10, he says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Salvation. The mission of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, the only mission of Jesus. She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? He shall save, he shall save. He shall save his people. That's the mission of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to give you a car. He didn't come to give you a house. Because without Jesus, you can have a house and you can have a car. Before Jesus came, people had houses, people had cars, people had money. In fact, they were marrying and giving in marriage. So the mission of Jesus is not to give you things, car, house, money. That's not the assignment. The mission of Jesus is to save. To save his people. To save his people. Mission statement. From their sins. So the scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Soteria. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The faith that comes by the message of Christ Jesus. The next verse, all scripture, the Greek word for all scripture is pasagraphe, pasagraphe, all scripture given by inspiration of God. Or to say all scripture are God breath, God breathed out the scriptures, all scriptures are God breath or given by the inspiration of God and now there's a borderline, he gives us a borderline, there's a borderline, they are profitable. The scriptures are given by inspiration of God and they are profitable. This is the area where the scriptures are supposed to profit you. Outside of this area, the scripture will not be relevant to you. They are profitable. The scriptures are given by the inspiration of God and they are profitable. The scriptures are profitable. They are profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine means learning. The scriptures profit us in the area of doctrine or learning. Learning where? Learning in the area of reproof. We learn from the scriptures in the area of reproof because the scriptures are to profit us in the area of learning as it regards reproof in Christ. Reproof in Christ. The word reproof means evidence. The scriptures are given to us to form the borderline for our evidence. That's to say, it doesn't matter what dream you had. It doesn't matter what vision you had. Even if the vision came after 50 days of fasting and prayer, if it does not agree with the scripture, put it in the dustbin because the scriptures are given to form the basis for our evidence. They are profitable for reproof. 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 As part of our doctrine. Reproof and correction. The scriptures are given to correct us. To correct us because sometimes you can hold on to something that you thought was the right thing. But as you grow and as you mature in the things of God, you suddenly discover that what you thought was right was not actually right. So you must be open to be corrected. And what corrects us is the scriptures. The scriptures form the basis for our correction. It is given to us for correction. Number one, for doctrine. Doctrine in reproof. Number two, correction and for instructions in righteousness don't just instructions the scriptures are not given to just instruct us but to instruct us as it regards righteousness why that the man of god that the man of god 
that the man of God may be perfect. When the man of God is exposed to the scriptures that gives us doctrine in the area of reproof, in the area of correction, in the area of instructions in righteousness, the outcome of that is that the man of God becomes perfect, matured, developed, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The book of John chapter 5 verse 39, Jesus speaking said, search the scriptures, search the graphe, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify. The word testify is the Greek word for evidence. The scriptures give evidence to me they testify of me the mission of the scripture is to testify of me that is to say that the scriptures therefore have a borderline for operation what is the borderline doctrine doctrine where in christ in what area reproof which other area correction which other area instructions we are in righteousness why that the man of god may be perfect so therefore now jesus says these scriptures evidence they are an evidence they are a testimony of me i am the message of the scriptures they testify of me the scriptures are not testifying of you the scriptures are a testimony of me i am the message of the scriptures outside me the scriptures remove jesus from the bible is a quran because the bible is jesus book it's a Christocentric book carrying a Christocentric message. It is a message centered on Christ. Christocentric. He said they testify of me. I am the message of the scriptures. Hallelujah. Luke 24, 25. Luke 24, 25. Now on their way to Emmaus, two gentlemen after the resurrection of Christ, they were discussing Jesus on their way to Emmaus. And the Bible says Jesus joined their company and he said to them, gentlemen, what are you discussing? And they rebuked Jesus and said, are you a stranger? Are you not aware of what happened to that good man? You know, the disciples thought Jesus was a martyr. They thought they killed him because he was a good man. They didn't know that it was a substitutionary sacrifice. He didn't die a martyr, he died a substitute. So they were discussing about the martyrdom of this good guy who was doing good to everybody and was a blessing to everybody. And while they were talking, the good guy joined the camp. But they didn't know him. The previous verse said their eyes were holding that they may not know him. So a man can be preaching Jesus but doesn't know Jesus. The problem with our churches today is that Jesus has been thrown out and other things have replaced Jesus. We have developed a curriculum for ourselves that successfully excludes Jesus. What we have is Jesus for opening prayer and Jesus for closing prayer. The rest is our curriculum. And Jesus is saying, no, things are not going to be like this. I bought the church. The church is my property and I'm taking back my church. I'm taking back my church because I bought it with my blood. The church is my property. It is called the church of the firstborn. The church of, he owns the church. And he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. They didn't understand what he was talking about. They thought he was talking about the temple of Solomon, but he was talking about his body. He was saying, if you kill and bury me, I will not rise one. I will rise with my brothers. The church of Jesus. I will build my church. The message is Jesus. If it's not Jesus, Charles Spurgeon, 1876. 1876. Charles Spurgeon said, When you stand on the pulpit and your message is not Jesus, shut up. Go home and sit down until when you have something to offer. 1876. Charles Spurgeon in 1876 said, The time will come when 
preachers of the gospel will no more feed the sheep, but they will hire clowns to entertain the goats. And that's what's happening in our churches today. Comedians all over our pulpit making people laugh. The only reason why you bring comedians to your church is when the Holy Ghost is no more there. Because there's no comedy that can replace the joy of the Holy Ghost. There's no comedy that can replace the joy of salvation. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. The joy of salvation has no measurement. There is no psychology that can replace what the Holy Ghost can do in a life. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life and the scriptures are a testimony of me. Then he said to them in Luke 24, 25, O oh fools, Jesus called them fools. Jesus himself. He was not abusing them, he was describing their state. O oh fools and slow of heart to believe. All, all that the prophets have spoken all major and minor prophets all of their messages jesus took all the messages of the prophets and compressed it and he's about to tell us what was their message all that this is jesus talking all that the prophets have spoken what did the prophet speak all the major and the minor prophets next verse art not christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. That is the entire summary of all those big, big Old Testament books. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah. All of them put together. All those big books. This is a summary in two sentences in the mouth of the message. In the mouth of the message. He said this is all they were trying to say. They used many words and couldn't end up saying it. Why? Because of their spiritual state. He said what they were trying to tell is that I will suffer. Because this is about me. I will suffer and after suffering I will enter my glory. That's all they were trying to say in many words. Then he added the next verse 27. I'm beginning at Moses. When you read the Bible and you hear beginning at Moses, he's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible, they are called Moses. So now Jesus wants to take these gentlemen who are fools through a Bible study that will deliver them from foolishness. And how does he do that? He begins at Moses. Who is Moses? The lawgiver. So is there Jesus in the law? Yes. The law was just trying to say Jesus. But because he couldn't say Jesus, he said, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. He's trying to represent Jesus as a standard. But they couldn't say Jesus, so they, they had to work with types and shadows. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded. That word expounded is where we get our hermeneutics from. That was the first time a lesson in hermeneutics took place in the whole Bible. To expound means to give adequate Bible interpretation. That was the beginning of hermeneutics as a, as a course of study in theology. That's where it started. Jesus was the first person that interpreted the scriptures because the scriptures are about him. You will never know the Bible until you know Jesus. Jesus is the key that unlocks the scriptures. Why? <laughs> because it's about him. It's Christocentric. Am I teaching here? Yeah, it's Christocentric. All right, so now he expounded unto them in some of the scriptures. Can we, can, can we say it together? How much of the scriptures? So now Jesus is doing a comprehensive Bible study. All the scriptures... The things concerning himself is the message of the Bible. He didn't expound to them everything. He expounded to them the things concerning himself. Outside him, no Bible. 
Oh, no wonder I say, search the scriptures. They testify of me. He expounded to them the things concerning himself. The Bible is not a book to teach your members how to make money. If you want them to make money, let them go to the university and you read commerce, read economics, read business management. The Bible is a Christ book. It's crystal. He says, the things concerning himself. And he gave us the borderline. The scriptures are given for doctrine in what area? Reproof, correction, instructions in righteousness. That is the, 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 the parameters with which this document called the scriptures are permitted to profit us. It's not a book on how to make it. The Bible is not a book on 25 steps to making it. Uh -uh. It's a book of Christ. The message is Christ. It speaks concerning him. He expounded to this gentleman the things concerning himself. Hallelujah. Then as he kept teaching them, look at verse 44. Verse 44 of that scripture. He said, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled. Jesus, the fulfillment of the scriptures. All things must be fulfilled. Which were written where? In the law of Moses. Because he is the center of the law of Moses. Moses was trying to say Jesus. But he couldn't say Jesus because of his spiritual state. So he just went... Blood on the doorpost. Ah, 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 ah. Brazen serpent. Ah, 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 ah. The ark of the covenant. Ah, 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 ah. The priest garment. Ah, 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 ah. The tabernacle. All those were Moses' attempt to say Jesus. But he couldn't say Jesus because he didn't have the capacity to say Jesus. I, I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. So instead of saying Jesus, he said, put the blood mark on your door. And when the devil sees the blood, he will pass over. Why? Because the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and they are saved thereby. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are we together here? Yeah. Moses said, okay. Uh, if the snakes are biting you, uh, 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 there is a brazen serpent. It doesn't matter how many snakes are biting you. Just look. Don't do anything. Look. Don't do anything. Look. Don't pray. Look. Don't fast. Look. Don't walk. Look. As long as you're looking, they will bite but not bite you. And Jesus showed up in John chapter 3. He said, as the serpent was lifted up by Moses, so shall the Son of God be lifted up. Why is the message of Jesus? It's the message of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the message of Jesus. Outside Jesus, we have no message. That's why Paul said, when I came among you, I desired to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us is the power of God that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's why I said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The message is Jesus. If you are not preaching Jesus, you are lost. The message is not solving people's problems. We are built our churches around problem solving. And that's not the gospel. Native doctors do that. Native doctors want to solve problems. Jesus didn't come to solve problems. When you have him in the first place, problem will fear you. Come, 
your problem will be over. That's not the gospel. Something is wrong somewhere. And that's why in some of our churches, our members remain perpetual babies. Perpetual babies, no growth. Ten years in your church, when they pray, you are embarrassed. No growth. Why no growth? The diet is wrong. Listen carefully. If your interpretation of the Bible is wrong, your application will be wrong. That's very critical. If your interpretation of the Bible is wrong, your practice will be wrong, your application will be wrong, and your results will be wrong. So it begins with interpretation, and that's what I want to jump into right now. It begins with interpretation. If you can't interpret the Bible, you can't teach it right. And if you can't teach it right, you become a copycat. And the problem with a copycat is you won't even know when you copy Satan. So there's the need for us to be able to interpret this book because this is this book that has been given to us for the work that we are supposed to do. No matter what vision or trance or prophecy or voice you heard. After all that hearings, it is still this book you have to work with. And for me, the nitty gritties are more important than anything. The fundamentals. So I'm going to run through a number of fundamentals today. And if we are able to run through as many as possible, I'll be very happy and fulfilled. Because once the interpretation is right, every confusion goes. That's where the problem is. The problem is with the interpretation. So we've established that the Bible is Jesus' book. He said, these are the words I spoke to you while I was with you. That all things in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me and the message the bible is not a message about how to make it your problems will be over no the bible is a message of christ that's why paul kept saying that i may know him not that i may have it that i may know him so when you build ministry around solving needs that's why you have members who come to church on sunday morning and in the night they're with a native doctor because they want the thing to happen fast. And if they wait for some time, nothing is changing. They look for another place. Why? Because you've given them the wrong focus. The Bible is Jesus' book. He said, concerning me. And what was the next thing he did? Verse 45. Then opened he their understanding. That they might understand the scriptures. Not that they may understand him. He doesn't want them to know him physically. He wants them to know him in scripture. Not in pictures. But in the word. Listen, let me give you something here. Peter was with Jesus physically. He slept with Jesus, ate with Jesus, even rebuked Jesus. Okay? But it took Paul to teach Peter Jesus. And yet Paul never saw Jesus. It was Paul that trained Peter. Go check your Bible. It was Paul that taught Peter. And even with Paul teaching Peter, Peter kept saying, we know our brother Paul. He is speaking things that are hard. Ah, look at Peter. Peter was with Jesus. Yet Peter is shouting for Paul who never saw Jesus. Why? Revelation is better than experience. What is revealed to you will keep you for life. Experience, you can doubt it. So God doesn't want you to know him by experience. He wants you to know him by revelation. That's why Paul's prayer was that the eyes of your understanding be in light. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So let's get into this now. When we say the scriptures, the Bible, the entire Bible is not the scriptures. The entire Bible is not the scriptures. I know on the page of your Bible, they wrote the Holy Scriptures. All right? It's okay. But the entire book is not called the scriptures. Because when Jesus said, search the scriptures, there was no book of John. 
when Paul told Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration, there was no book of Timothy. When Jesus said, you do err because you know not the scripture, nor the power of God, there was no book of John. So, the scriptures therefore refers to the Old Testament. Genesis to Malachi is called the scripture or the body of truth. Genesis to Malachi. It is called the scripture. That's the scripture. So what is Matthew to Revelation? Romans 16, 25. Paul gives us a description of Matthew to Revelation. Now to him, that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. I love Paul. He always laid claim on the things he taught. He called it my gospel. Why was it? Why was he calling it his gospel? Because he got it by revelation. What you get by revelation is your personal property. He called it my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus. Now, that and in the Greek is which is. My gospel which is the preaching of Jesus Christ. It's not my gospel and the preaching as two articles. No, no, no. It's my gospel. What is that my gospel? Which is the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's the way it is in the original manuscript. My gospel, which is the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery. The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So Paul now says that the New Testament is called the revelation of the mystery. The Old Testament is called the scriptures or the mystery. Mark 4 11, Jesus said to them unto you it's given to know the mystery. He's talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is called mystery. Or the Old Testament is called the, 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 the scriptures. The New Testament is called the revelation of the mystery. Why? The Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. So the New Testament is the decoder of the codes of the Old Testament. You cannot know the Old Testament by reading the Old Testament. To know the Old Testament, you will have to look at the Old Testament with New Testament glasses. Because the New Testament reveals the mystery of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is types and shadows promises and prophecies the new testament is the reality the old testament is types shadows promises prophecies the new testament is the reality of the types the shadows the promises and the prophecies so therefore to know what the shadow was trying to say i look at the shadow from the real when I see the real, I will understand the communication of the shadows. I can never know. I can never know the Old Testament by reading the Old Testament. I need the revelation of the New Testament to unravel the mystery called the Old Testament. Are we in the house? If you're with me, shout, I hear you. Follow me very carefully because it's very key. Matthew to Revelation, the revelation of the mystery. Genesis to Malachi, the mystery or the scriptures. A man of God asked me, said, I'm trying to do a study on the Antichrist. Why will I get material? I say, go to Satan. Because only Satan can give you the revelation of the Antichrist. Because Antichrist is Satan's product. And if you want to know about a product, you go to the manufacturer. Then he said to me, what about the book of Revelation? I said, the book of Revelation is not about Antichrist. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1-1, one, one, put it up for me. Revelation 1-1, one, one. everybody, the first sentence, can we read together like a mass choir? Want to go. The revelation, that's the article that the book is talking about. 
The book of Revelation is not a book on end time events. It's not a book about red moon and black moon and brown moon. It's a book about Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the subject. And then Jesus begins to talk about himself and his under shepherds and their message to the churches. He began to talk about it to the angel of the church in places and the things they are teaching because the rebuke in the book of Revelation is not rebuke for stealing or lying. It's rebuke for wrong doctrine. That people are teaching wrong doctrine. All the churches that were rebuked in the book of Revelation, of all the seven churches, six of them were preaching wrong doctrine. Only one preached the doctrine of Christ. It's not a book about four horns and five horns. It's a book about Christ. But it metaphor, metaphoric language is used in the writing of the book. But when the metaphors are unlocked, it is Jesus he's talking about. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm teaching here. Yeah, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. So therefore, the Old Testament is the mystery or the Old Testament is a scripture. The New Testament is the revelation of the scripture. Now follow me. Matthew to Revelation is not the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament does not include Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The New Testament begins from Acts of the Apostles. Why do you say that, man of God? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historic books recording the humanity of Jesus. They are historic books. It is only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will see that Jesus cried. Jesus was tired. Jesus ate. Jesus slept. It's a record of his humanity. So they are historic books. They are not doctrinal books. Secondly, Matthew 26, 28. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins so until the blood was shed there was no new testament the new testament is a byproduct of the shed blood and in matthew mark luke and john the blood has not been shed at the end of john the blood was shed so the beginning of the shedding of blood was acts the bible says after his resurrection that's where the new testament started that's why the church is called the church of the firstborn so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament books. And that is why if you teach from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John alone, you will make mistakes. You will end up in heresy because those are not doctrinal books. Those are historical books. And some of us, that's why our messages stay on. We just stay there. When the strong man fully armed, keep at his palace. His goods are in peace. But when the stronger than he shall come, he shall bounce on him. So now let us pray. You are behind time 2,000 years. That scripture is not for the church. No, 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 no. That scripture is not for the church. Jesus was saying, Satan the strong man has arrested man and kept man in bondage. But when I die and rise, I will disarm him. And that is why after he rose, he disarmed principalities and powers. And he said, all power is given unto me. I don't know if I'm teaching here. So you can't use the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to teach the New Testament believer. Those are historical books recording the humanity of Jesus, revealing to us how that Jesus was a man. Hebrews tells us where a testament is. There must of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is only of force after men are dead. So until Jesus died, there was no New Testament. So the New Testament begins from Acts to Revelation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, historical books recording the humanity of jesus i have news for you genesis is not old testament genesis is not old testament so where does the old testament begin from hebrews chapter 8 verse 7 for if that first covenant had been faultless the old testament is a faulted testament so when you preach from the Old Testament, you are giving the people of God expired milk. 
poisoned food because it's a faulty testament by God himself. For if that first testament or covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Next verse. For finding fault, because I'm going to get there later on. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Next verse. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. When did he make that old covenant? In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So the Old Testament started from Exodus. The movement of the people. So when we say Old Testament, we are talking of Exodus to Malachi. When we talk about New Testament, Acts to Revelation. What is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Historic books. So what is Matthew? Matthew, I mean, what is Genesis? Genesis is referred to in Matthew 19.6. Jesus gives us a definition of what Genesis is. Matthew 19 verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Next verse. They said unto him, Why did Moses, talking about the, 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 the Moses, this Moses, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So what is Genesis? Beginning. Genesis called the beginning. The Old Testament is Exodus to Malachi. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, historic books. Acts to Revelation, New Testament. Are we together here? Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Thank you, Lord. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Follow carefully now. Ministered by us. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Written not with ink. So there is an epistle written with ink. And there is another epistle written with the spirit of the living God. So he is dealing with two epistles here now. Alright. Now by the spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone. So there is an epistle written in the tables of stone. But in fleshly tables of the heart. And there is another one written in fleshly tables of the heart. So Paul is dealing with two different testaments here he said one is on stone another is in the heart one is with ink another is with the spirit of god next verse and such thrusts are we through christ to god's word next verse not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of god can somebody shout my sufficiency is of god can i hear you shouting like a prophecy for 2016 I prophesy over you by the power of the Holy Ghost, this will be your year of total sufficiency. Every lack in your life will be embarrassed by the grace of God. You will see supply like you have never seen before. Your ministry will move to a whole new level of exploits, a whole new level of revelation, a whole new level of impact. If your amen is louder, receive the grace to manifest. Lift your hands and say, my sufficiency is of god one more time my sufficiency is of god now hear me by word of prophecy this year buildings you never knew how to finish will be finished supernatural money you don't know where it came from will hit your bank account if your amen is louder sufficiency from every side don't your neighbor say i prophesy to you your days of luck are over i didn't hear a dangerous amen 
all right sit down let's go so our sufficiency is of god we are not sufficient of ourselves our sufficiency is not in our style our technique our technical know-how our strategy no 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 absolutely is of god next verse now this is where the rubber meets the road who also half somebody say half what is half pastors pastors somebody say i have not yet been ordained have not been consecrated he has if you don't like it you can tear it from your bible who has made us able who is able here who has made us able not just able ministers why are we able ministers because of the testament we dispense our ability is not in us our ability is in the testament that we are dispensing our ability is that we are able ministers of the new testament that's where the ability is not of the later not of the later that kill it but the spirit give it life so paul is not saying there are those who dispense the old testament but we have been made able ministers and we dispense the new testament we are dispensers of the new testament and any preacher dispensing the old testament is a killer because the old testament is the later and the later kill it poison food people come to church they are smiling but they don't know what they're eating is poison because it is later why is it later not because you are not jumping and shouting but because of the content it's not the jump it's not the shout it's not the scream it's not the running it's not the razzmatazz it is what are you saying the content the content that's what makes ministry ministry is not suit and tie and, and, and big jeep and, and fine house that, that's no ministry if that is ministry then we have lost god because hollywood stars measure themselves by material things and we men of god don't measure ourselves by material things we measure ourselves by word we will give ourselves to the ministry of what the word and prayer so the true word of a man of god is not in what he wears it's in the content he carries I don't respect you because you drove a Lamborghini. And I don't respect you because you drove a Ferrari. I don't respect you because you came down from a chopper. And I don't respect you because you fly a private jet. But my brother, give me some revelation from the word of God. That is ministry. We have had wrong models of ministry. And these wrong models are making young ministers go into things they shouldn't go into. Young ministers are meeting native doctors to put something in their tongue so crowd can gather. Because they have been told, for you to be successful, you must have 10,000, 20,000. Who gave you that life from the pit of hell? Church ministry success is not measured by crowd. It's measured by the message you carry. Because years after you go, nobody will remember the car you drove. Nobody will remember the house you live. And how many members you have. But they will remember your message. If you had a message. I tell preachers all over the world as I do school of ministries. I tell them if you measure ministerial success by the crowd in a man's church, you are carnal. Totally carnal. Do I have something against crowd? No. But crowd is not a yardstick. And preachers are killing themselves trying to gather crowd that Jesus is not involved in with all kinds of tricks and church marketing styles and that's why instead of gathering regenerated people we have a bunch of unbelievers rebranded having a form of godliness without power but something is shifting and something is changing and something is moving lift your legs like, shut fire yeah yeah please sit down let's talk a little more 
if crowd is the yardstick for measuring ministry, what about the fishermen across the river that the whole village is 100 and one pastor must pastor them? Somebody must go there and pastor them. They are across the river, no roads, no light, no big auditoriums, no electricity. And yet somebody must go there and pastor them. A village of 100 people may end up having a church of 45 or 50 people in that village. And for the whole of his life, he has to pastor them. He can't leave that village. Is that man not a success? So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Get that stress off your head and just face Jesus. We see Jesus. When you see Jesus, you will know that my body is, my yoke is easy, my body is light. Those are not yardsticks, man. I desire to know nothing among you. Save Christ. If I'm speaking, shout I hear. If it's not Jesus, we're wasting our time. We're not here for a Hollywood match. We're not here for impressing people. We're here to repre represent Jesus. We're here to make Jesus known. We're here to make him known. That's the message. What brought me into all of that? He has made us able ministers. Your ability is not in the car you drive. Your ability is in the testament you are dispensing. Able ministers of the New Testament. That's where the that's where the ability is in the testament you are dispensing. Able ministers of the New Testament, not of the later. For the later kill it, but the Spirit give it life. Now watch, watch, watch. Next verse. Watch. But if the ministration of death. So there is a ministry that after it is ministered to the people, what they get is death. If the ministration of death, where is the ministration of death? Written and engraving in stones. So any message coming from the Ten Commandments of Moses and the 612 laws to regulate the Ten Commandments is the ministration of death. Let me give you something, an analogy. The day Moses brought the Ten Commandments, the moment he arrived among the people, after he broke it, 3,000 people died. The arrival of the Ten Commandments buried 3,000 people. Because it's a ministry of death. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came, 3,000 people were saved. What we lost in the law, we recovered in grace. I came to prophesy to somebody. Whatever you have lost your lifetime is coming back. Somebody shout restore. Shout restore three times. Two. Three. Somebody shout I receive restoration by the Holy Ghost of everything lost. I didn't hear your amen like thunder. Yeah. 3,000 people died when the Ten Commandments came. Because it is a testament of death. But on the day of Pentecost, when the spirit of adoption, the spirit of adoption, when that spirit came down, 3,000 men were born again to replace what the Lord took from us. Listen to me, 2016, you will operate at another level. Your amen is looking for prayer. You will, you will operate at another level. Please sit down. Let's talk a little more. Next verse. If the ministration of death written and engraving in stones was glorious. Listen carefully. There is a glory that goes with that ministry. When you preach Old Testament, it has a glory. The glory is that all your members will keep depending on you. They can never stand on their own. And that is a glory. You will enjoy all that kind of, my members cannot do without me. 
when I sit down in the office, 300 people are lined up for, for counseling. It shows what a lazy man of God you are. Because if you are not a lazy pastor, one hour on the pulpit should solve their problems. The number of people that come to see you for counseling is an indictment on your diligence in your assignment. Because if the people are taught properly, they won't come for counseling. There is a glory in that testament. There is a glory in that testament. Your members can pray. You are the only one that can pray for them. They cannot pray. It's man of God. Man of God. Papa, touch here. Touch here. Touch here. They, they, don't, they can't stand on their own. If you are not there, they are lost. That is the glory. Oh. The worship is called hero worship. Under the law, man is in charge. Under grace, no man takes glory. Under the law, everybody looks up to you. You are everything. But in the New Testament, it's about nobody. It's Jesus. Christ in you. Are we together here? Look at the next thing he says. If it was glorious, that means the law had glory. So don't be deceived. If a man of God is preaching law, this law, law preaching. And his members are looking like Satan's junior brothers. Yeah, it has a glory. They all look like they are going to heaven tomorrow. Because physically, the way they are behaving, they behave holy. Inside them, they are rotting. There's bitterness, anger, competition, wickedness inside their heart. But they are dressed from head to leg. Nothing is showing. So there is a glory. But that glory is an outward glory. Put it up for me where we were. It says, was glorious. Now look at the next thing. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Now the impression you have there is that Moses had so much glory because of the law that nobody could look at him. So he had to cover his face. That's a lie. What happened was that the glory of Moses was fading. It was disappearing. And Moses was a smart leader. He didn't want the people to see him, to see him gloryless. So since he knew that the glory was going, he covered his face fast, fast. Giving them the impression that the thing is too heavy. But the glory was just going. Look at it. It's written there. For the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. It was a glory that was passing. When you preach the Old Testament, you will have some glory, but after some time, it will disappear. It can last. That glory is not designed to last. The glory was to be done away. Next verse. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? There's a glory that is bigger than the glory of Moses. It is the glory of Jesus. Somebody shout, I love Jesus. How many of you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses, Elijah appeared with Jesus and Peter said, Say, this is the first time we have seen the whole Bible complete. Moses, the lawgiver, Elijah, the prophet, the law restorer, Jesus, grace. Jesus, grace. Somebody's looking at me. Jesus is grace. Somebody say, you know, all these grace preachers, they are looking for license to sin. You don't need to preach grace to sin. Even people preaching law, people are sinning. So it is not grace that is making people sin. And moreover, Jesus is the grace of God. The Bible says, of his fullness, have we all received what? So Jesus is full of grace. That means anywhere you press inside Jesus, what comes out is grace. He's the embodiment of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne where grace is sitting. The throne is on. Grace is the one sitting on that throne. That we may obtain grace and find mercy to help. So Moses the law. Elijah. The Lord restorer or the prophet, Jesus, the grace of God. Peter says, Sigh, man, let's build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Jesus, one for Elijah. Moses said to Elijah, Did you hear what that boy is saying? Bye bye. Moses was gone. Elijah was gone. All of them disappeared. Then the heavens opened. 
and a voice came from heaven and god the father said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased hear this one don't hear the other ones this is the man to hear ladies and gentlemen if you are not preaching jesus you are behind time tell somebody hear jesus only tell somebody i trust jesus more than i trust moses okay sit down let's talk sit down let's talk are we together here are we together here listen very carefully listen very carefully that's why in the beginning i begged you to be patient with me please don't put me off i may have trampled on some of your theology be patient with me that's why i'm taking time to open scriptures we don't want to just carry things in our head let's see it the way it is in the book because the book is the basis for our doctrine doctrine in the area of reproof correction and instruction in righteousness so let's stay within the confines of this book and let the scriptures interpret themselves hear jesus only why must you hear jesus listen carefully moses never saw god never not even once Elijah never saw God. In fact, Adam never saw God. I know you go like this. Wait. Adam never saw God. None of them saw God. John 1 18. We will go back to Corinthians. No man hath seen God. Stop. Was Moses a man? Adam. Elijah. Elisha. Jeremiah. Ezekiel, Obadiah, Nahum, Jonah, Joel. None of them. This is Jesus talking. The one that God said here. He said no man has seen God at any time. The Greek word for at any time is ever yet. That is say until now. Until now that I am talking, anybody that came until now never saw God. So if they never saw God, it means everything they said was based on their impressions. And some were based on rumors. And some were based on assumptions. What am I saying? Look at it. The only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he had that is i am the one i am the exclusive custodian of the father and my job is to show him i am the tangible manifestation of god without me you can't see god and i never came like this before so that means my coming now is to reveal god to you that's why i said to philip how about philip how are you asking me to show you the father have i been this long with you and you don't know the father he that has seen me has seen the father jesus is the father jesus is saying i'm the only father you will ever see somebody say what do you mean his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god huh? who is everlasting father Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God trapped in time. Jesus is God trapped in time. So who gave Moses the Ten Commandments? An angel. Moses never saw God. Somebody said to me some time ago, can you prove it? Yes. Hebrews 2.2. 2. For if the word spoken by, angels. can I hear you? If, for if the word spoken by, angels were steadfast, and under that covenant, every transgression and disobedience received what? A just recompense of reward. What is he talking about? The law. Because under the law, a tit for a, a tooth. I'll be a tooth for a tat, whatever one. An eye for an eye. Yeah, every transgression was punished. Then now, 
Paul, the writer of Hebrews, what am I calling Paul? The writer of Hebrews is making a comparison between the old and the new. So he first tells us what happened in the Old Testament. Now he wants to talk about the new. Next verse. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation. So this now is talking about what Jesus brought. The other one is talking about what Moses brought. And who gave it to him? Angels. Somebody said, do you have another scripture? Yes. Acts 7, 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? Who gave Moses the Ten Commandments? Angels. Somebody said, do you have another one? Yes. Galatians 3, 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Verse 19. Wherefore then, serve the law. It was added. The law is an addendum. The law is not God's plan for man. It was not part of God's original plan. The law was just an addendum. It was added because of transgressions. It was not the plan. That's not the mind of God. That's not the will of God to give you a law. No, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and the law was ordained by in the hands of a who is the mediator? Moses. The go-between. So the old covenant was administered by angels and it was powered by the blood of animals. The blood of bulls and goats. That is why it was a covenant that was operated by angels. It wasn't God. Moses never saw God. And that's why if you preach that testament, you kill people. Because that testament has no life. Animal blood cannot save a man. So it will kill people. I'm teaching here. It has no life. It's a killer. Are we here? Yeah, he's a killer. It has no life. But today, most of our messages are framed around the Old Testament. Because we're lazy. We don't want to study. The New Testament is not for lazy people. The New Testament requires a lot of diligence to be able to study the New Testament because you're dealing with revelation here. The Old Testament is stories. You can preach it anyhow. Even an unbeliever can read the Old Testament and preach. But no New Testament. Cause for a lot of work. Are we in the house? If you're hearing me, say I hear you. From what we're just hearing now, the New Testament is older than the Old Testament. But I won't deal with that today. i leave that for another time. The, the New Testament came before the Old Testament. The Old Testament interrupted the New Testament. The coming of Christ cleared it out and continued it. The Old Testament is older. Abraham didn't operate under the law. He operated New Testament. He didn't operate law. Abraham is older than the law. The law came after Abraham. And it is Abraham that brought the law. It's not even Moses. It's not Moses that brought the ten. He's not the originator of the Ten Commandments. The law started with Abraham. Abraham is the brain behind all these things. Father Abraham. He initiated these things. Many people don't know where the law came from. It started from the house of Abraham. Why? The book of Roma, I mean Galatians tells us Abraham had two children. One by the flesh, one by the spirit. The one that is by the flesh persecuted, the one that is by the spirit. Which is an allegory or a figure of speech. But it talks about the two covenants. One Mount Sinai and one Arabia in the house of Abraham. So the law came from Ishmael. Grace came from Isaac. All in the house of Abraham. Moses was just a victim of circumstances. That is why because he was a victim of circumstances. After he gave them the law. He said God if I have found grace. Show me. He gave them law and walk on that grace. Yes Abraham. He gave them ten commandments. Then he himself. He walked on that grace. He said if I have found grace in your sight. Show me the way. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Somebody shout yes! 
Are we in the house? Yeah. So, so now let's get back to our, our, our previous scripture where we were. Are you blessed? All right, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where we were, verse number, verse number 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Next verse. For if the ministration of condemnation, the Old Testament is called the ministration of condemnation. Do you know what that means? Every time you read from the Old Testament, people must be condemned. You can never preach from the Old Testament and your members are smiling. They must fall short. Every message from the Old Testament must make you repent. You must cry. You can't leave church rejoicing because nobody can measure up. So it is a ministry of condemnation. If the ministration of condemnation be glory, it has a glory in it. It will make people cry. It will make people fall on the ground and roll. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And the man of God will be happy that they are crying. See, all of them are crying today. Crying. Is that good news? Good news don't make people cry. Good news make people rejoice. So people are always crying when you preach. You need to check yourself and check your message. Because good news don't make people cry. Good news make people rejoice. The ministry of condemnation, much more, much more, that the ministration of righteousness exceed. You can't compare. You can't compare Moses with Jesus. No, you can't. The ministration of the Spirit is more glorious. And these are the days of the Spirit. It's much more glorious. Next verse. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. That's why when Jesus appeared, Moses disappeared. You can't compare it. No. You can't compare a preacher of Jesus to a preacher of the Ten Commandments or the preacher of the Old Testament. You can't compare. The preacher of Jesus will at last. He will outlive at last. He will make more impact. You can't measure it exceeds it exceeds in glory it exceeds in glory there is a glory that excels hallelujah i said hallelujah there's a glory that excels next verse for if that which is done away did you see that that which is what done away it is rusticated that which is done away was glorious. Much more. That which remained, which is the New Testament, which is the ministry we all have received, is glorious. Next verse. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. We try to break it down. The mysteries are too complicated. We try to break them down so that our people can understand. Next verse. And not as Moses, which put a vial over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look. He covered his face. Why couldn't they look? They couldn't look to the end of that which is abolished. Done away with whatever moses brought has been abolished to preach it is to preach expired food it's been done away this is god speaking it's done away with moses and all the things moses brought is done away with let's visit a little bit of what moses brought moses and the angel concocted the ten commandments how did it start? Exodus 19. That's where it all started. This whole thing started in Exodus 19. How many of you remember? The children of Israel in Egypt were sinners. They were murmuring and they were not living by God's standard. Yet God brought them out. God brought them out. He said, I bring you out. By myself. They were murmuring on the road. He gave them water. It's not because they were perfect. 
They misbehave. He gave them manna. They abused Moses. He split the Red Sea for them. What is that? That's not a man's, what a man deserves. That's what grace makes available. That's the grace of God at work. Grace is not a message of today. It's the message of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, you see grace all over the place. The Bible says his mercy endures. He's a gracious God. If I look at this, how many of you remember the first time man sinned against God? Adam and Eve. God didn't destroy them. God didn't throw thunder down. He came down and said, Adam, where are thou? Adam said, I'm naked. Who told you? He said, the woman. Which woman? Then God rolled the sleeve, caught an animal by himself, killed the animal, skinned the animal, and covered them. That's not an angry God, though. That's a gracious God. That's a loving father. Somebody said, but he kicked them out of the garden. No, he didn't kick them out of the garden. What did he do? He said, these guys are experts in eating tree. If I leave them now, they will eat the tree of life. And if they eat the tree of life, there will be no more redemption. So in order for me to protect them so that they can be delivered from their predicament, let me take them out and protect the tree for them. He didn't protect the tree from them. He protected the tree for them. That's the love of God. That's a loving father. That's a gracious God. Are we together here? The first murder in the Bible. First time murder ever. First time there was murder in the history of mankind. First time there was murder. God didn't thunder. God came down and said, where is your brother Abel? He said, am I my brother's keeper? That doesn't sound like a distant relationship. That sounds like a familiar relationship. If God and Cain were not talking, Cain would not have the audacity to answer God like that. They must have been conversing. That is why Cain could have the audacity to say, I'm my brother's keeper. I don't know where he is. After he has done wrong. God said, you're a fugitive and a vagabond. Cain said, oh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. God took a stone, put a mark on Cain and said, anybody that touched Cain, I will deal with you. See God protecting a murderer. That's the grace of God. That's why David said, if you shall count iniquity, who can stand? But there is mercy with you that you may be feared. Paul speaking said, it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. It's goodness. The goodness of God. In spite of the bad things you have done, God is still good. In spite of all your mistakes, God is still good. When you calculate his goodness, you cannot but just break down and surrender yourself. You don't win people by, by punishment. You win people by love. I'm teaching here. Now look at this. In Exodus 19, the children of Israel said to God, enough is enough. You've just been treating us like little boys. Before we talk, you give. Before you talk, you give us. Don't give us again. We want to earn it. Exodus 19, we want to earn everything. God says, Moses, did they say you should tell me that? Moses said, that's what they said. God said, okay, tell them from now, if anybody come near this mountain, he will die. Distance have started. None of them should come anymore. Then you, Moses, after you tell them, come up to Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai, Moses, and the angel meet. They are writing the Ten Commandments. Before they finish, Israel have broken the first one. These are the people that say, we can take care of ourselves. We can meet the standard of God. They are still writing the commandments for them. Before they finish writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, they have broken number one. So the angel says, Moses, Israel have sinned. Moses came down and saw the riot in the camp. He couldn't bear it. So what did he do? Bam! So Moses is the first person that broke all the ten commandments. In fact, Moses only so bad, he didn't break one. He broke all. He's the first breaker. Moses. Moses. The lawgiver is the first law breaker. And he didn't break five. He didn't break eight. He broke all. To show you nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. They were not designed for you to keep. They were not designed. The stiffness of the regulation of the Ten Commandments shows you that's not the mind of God for you. 
Because he says 630 laws and commandments. If you break one, you break all. Which man can be that right? Because God never wanted you to keep it. So what happens now? Moses comes back to the angel and says to the angel, they are broken. The angel said, eh, how did they break? He said, eh, I broke them. He said, you, right. Since you broke the one I gave you, you have to write by yourself. So Moses now sat down himself and wrote the Ten Commandments. That is why it is called the law of It was Moses that gave them. How do we know it was Moses? Because when Jesus came, he corrected it. Yes, Matthew chapter 5 verse 21, put it up for me. Jesus corrected Moses seriously. All right, look at it. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shall not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. 22. But I say, Jesus, where are you quoting your own from? You just quoted the Ten Commandments and now you're quoting. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This is Jesus now. He's correcting Moses. You have heard it said, but I say. If you read on, you will see more and more. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord his oath. Next verse. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Next verse. Nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these, cometh of evil. Jesus, what are you doing? I'm correcting Moses. What Jesus is saying, this is what, if I was the one that wrote for Moses, this is what I would have written. So he is marking Moses' script and canceling and correcting because remember, the Lord testify of him. He's putting things in right perspective. He's correcting Moses. Why? Because the ministry of the later is condemnation. The ministry of the Old Testament is death. Next verse. Go back to Corinthians where we are. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse number 313. And not as Moses would put a vial over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day that you are sitting here Remained the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. As long as you stay with Moses, you will have a veil. But the moment you turn to Christ, the veil will be talking. Then when the veil is taken and you look at the Old Testament, you will see Christ. If you read with the veil, you can't see Jesus. But when the veil is taken, all over the Bible, you see Jesus. Because the book is about him. If you're with me, shout, I hear you. Now, now, next verse, verse 16. Go, go back to 15. But even unto this day, somebody say this day. Please talk to me, say this day. Unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Till now, if you read Moses without the revelation of the New Testament, you can, you'll be confused. It is because of lack of this revelation that we have messages in our churches today like go to your village and break the foundation. So people are going to village to go and break foundation. The question is which foundation are they breaking? In the New Testament, Bible says no other foundation 
Can any man lay than that which is laid, Christ Jesus? If any man be in Christ, he's on a sure foundation. There's no more foundation to break in the village. So what we are doing is we have what I call cross-testamental application. Borrowing things from the Old Testament and applying it to the new creation. Which makes the product a bad product. The Old Testament is not a complement of the New Testament. The New Testament is a replacement. Yes. When you mix the old and new, you have a bad product. You do not pour new wine into old wine skin. If not, it will burst. Which foundation are you breaking for a believer in Christ? Coming into Christ is a sure foundation. And no other foundation can anybody lay. No, no foundation you can lay that is better than Christ. Christ in a man is foundation. And not just foundation, sure foundation. I lay in Zion a sure foundation. Cross testamental application. That's why we have problems. So, we are preaching to new, new creations in Christ using the model of Old Testament. The break, break covenant, break covenant, break ancestral covenant, generational covenant. Where did they come from? The Old Testament. Where did generational and ancestral covenant start from? Exodus 20, the, the Ten Commandments. That's where it started. Moses said to the children of Israel, if you serve other gods, I will visit the iniquity of idolatry to the third and fourth generation. It was Moses that started it under the Old Testament. And in the same Old Testament, God corrected it. Because it was destroying people. God didn't wait for New Testament. Under the same Old Testament, he used the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah to correct Moses. How did God correct them? Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2. God punished the devil. What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That is what fathers did. The children are punished. It's called generational cause. God is asking through the prophet Ezekiel. Why are you using these statements? Why are you using this kind of talk for children of Israel? Why are you asking them to break causes and break covenants? Why are you preaching this kind of message? God is asking them through Ezekiel. Under the same Old Testament, the next verse. As long as I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb. Under the same Old Testament, God put an end to that practice of breaking of causes. He ended it. I'm teaching here. I'm teaching here. Yeah? And if there's anybody here that has been deceived to think it's from your village that do you, it's a lie. You are no more in your village. If any man be in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. I am led. My life is here with Christ. We are in God. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I have no past. I only have a future. And my future is glorious. What is my past? God. What is my future? God. Why? You are of God, little children. And have overcome the world. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So my past is God. My future is God. God behind, God in front. No generation. Am I teaching here? Stop punishing your members. And using it to manipulate them to collect small offering. Stop preaching for your stomach. Preach for Jesus. Jesus is a good paymaster. If you preach him, he will pay you well. Stop all these small, small things. Let's grow up. Let's grow up. Let's get out of all these things. All these native doctor practices. Let's get out of all those things. Let's preach this word. If this word cannot help, then get out of it. If you don't trust this Bible enough to help, if you have to ask extra curricular practice, Bible says, let every man be careful how he builds on this foundation. Be very careful how you're building because if any man use stubble or hay to build on Christ, 
if any man use double or hair, because when you start using manipulative tendencies to keep members, you are using stubble and hair on Christ, the foundation. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Listen carefully. Please write down if, if you want to write this. Stop subjecting the word of God to people's experience. Stop subjecting the word of God to people's experience. Using people's experience to bend the Bible. Bend their experience to the scripture. Bring every thought under subjection. That a sister that is born again had a dream and she's eating in the dream doesn't mean she's possessed. A born again child of God cannot be possessed. What is wrong with you? Anybody that is born of God cannot be possessed. Listen, for a believer to be possessed means Satan defeated Christ. It's sacrilege. That is after Christ took you and entered you to live inside you. Then Satan pushed Christ out and took over and Christ surrendered. When Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No man can pluck them out of my hand. My father that gave them to me is greater than all. Why? He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by faith. I'm teaching here. If you're hearing, shout, I hear you. He's able to save. You're not the one that saved yourself. He saved you. Somebody say, save you. Who is savior? Who saved you? Did you save yourself? Who saved you? Who keeps you? You don't keep yourself. He keeps you. He saved you. You were not, you are not a member of the adversary council that decided for Jesus to save you. While you were yet a sinner. You were a sinner. Ungodly. He died. He died. Stop trying to help him. He is not helpless. He is able. He's a faithful high priest. He's a faithful high priest. He's the champion of Zion. He's the first begotten from the dead. He is the Lord General of the church. He's the advocate of the church. He said, my little children, these things are right ye that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus, the righteous, who is the propitiation for your sin. And not for yours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let's stay with Christ. Throw away fables. Let me tell you the truth. The time has come and it won't be long from now. If you don't preach the New Testament, you will expire completely. I'm, I'm not joking. It's not a cause. It's an advice. You will expire in a way, even in the village, nobody will hear you. Because Jesus is opening people's eyes and ears very fast. Members are studying more than pastors. Some of you think you're the only one that have this opportunity. There are members that are living on the internet. They are listening to people like us. They are listening to other men of God around the world who are preaching the truth. And they have the Holy Spirit bearing witness. Deception will not last for too long anymore. Let's stay with the word of God. As it is revealed in the New Testament. Let's stay with the word of God. There's a concept that the church uses that is not a New Testament concept, but we use it all over the place. We even have something we coin for it that we use in our churches as programs, Operation Push. And the concept is that you have to pray until something happens. Where did they get it from? The unjust judge. That's where they got it from, the book of Luke. And I told you earlier on, don't stay with the gospels alone. You will enter error. Because the Gospels are not a doctrinal book. They are historical books. Jesus gave the parable of an unjust king who did not fear God or man. And a widow kept disturbing him. And the king said, let this woman disturb me by her continual coming. I will avenge her. 
Lest she weary me and wear me out. So what does the Bible tell tells us? The guy, Avenger. Then he said, how shall not God? It's a book of contrast. The book of Luke is a book of contrast. So when you read that book, you have to be careful. Because it's a book of contrast. Why, was, why did Luke use the language of contrast in writing his book? Because Luke was writing the book to an educated colleague called Theophilus. Theophilus was a very educated guy. And the only person that could convince Theophilus had to be an educated guy who was a physician by the name of Luke. And when educated people, when you want to minister to educated people, you don't send an illiterate. You send an educated, intelligent mind. So because Paul was writing to an educated guy called Theophilus, he had to use the language of contrast. Because that's the way to persuade a guy that is intelligent. You use contrast to communicate. So that's why the book of Luke is a book of contrast. There's a lot of intelligence in that book and there's a lot of interpretation required. Now, when Jesus said, a strong man, fully, I mean, when Jesus said, uh, this unjust judge, first of all, your God is not unjust. So that cannot apply to a believer. That already destroyed the concept of Operation Push. Your God is not an unjust God. That guy was an unjust king. You are not a widow. The woman that came was a widow. And then the reason behind him avenging her was lest she weary him. And God cannot be weary. He does not sleep nor slumber. So there is no way that parable relates to you and God. Moreover, he said before you call. It's not your prayer that makes me answer. I answer before you pray. Because I'm a loving father. I know what you need. Your heavenly father knows that you have need. It's not your prayer that makes God give you things. God gave, he gives your father pleasure to give you the kingdom. So you don't need any operation push. It's not a new testament concept. There's nothing you need that you don't have now. It's just that you're ignorant. There's nothing you need that you don't have. Everything you need in this life is already given. It's here. It's with you. You have everything. All the promises of God are in him. Where are they? In who? In Christ. Where are the promises? In Christ. Where are you? If any man be, all the promises of God, they are in him. Yes. So, in Christ, everything you need is supplied. When you grow in grace and in knowledge, listen carefully. When you grow in grace and in knowledge, your prayer request will become thanksgiving. You will no more have prayer requests. They will reduce the thanksgiving. Why do I know? Philemon 1.6 That the communication of thy faith may become how? effectual how by the acknowledging of every good thing that is where in you in christ so every good thing you need is already in you god is not going to do he did it in christ all you need to do is acknowledge what is the word acknowledge is the word epignosis come to a place of accurate specific precise knowledge the acknowledgement. You grow in light. You grow in grace. To a place where you acknowledge what God did in Christ in you. That's why all the time Jesus was on earth, he didn't ask the father for anything. The, Jesus never asked the father. And Jesus was our example. He never asked the father for anything. He would just say, thank you father that you hear me always. That these people may know that it is me and you that are doing this thing. Lazarus, come out. Huh? He didn't say, hey, spirit of death. <laughs> you, know, you know, people have the mentality that there are different levels of tongues. You know, there is machine gun tongue. It's canal, canal thinking. It's canal, the weapons of our warfare. Stop thinking canal. 
Jesus just said, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. Lazarus, come out. Wordy, sharp, sharp. Are you with me here? Another time. Father, thank you that you hear me always. Thank you for the bread. Give it to them. As they were breaking bread, it was increasing. There was no special intercessory session. It was just thanksgiving. When you grow in light, when you grow in the light of the finished work of Christ, everything becomes thanksgiving. Because now you know. Hey, hey, hey. Ephesians 120, put it up for me, I feel like running. Which he wrote. Somebody shall rot, rot, rot. Which he wrote where? Yeah, there was something wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, the work has been wrought. It has been wrought in him. Your job is to acknowledge it. God is not going to do. He finished everything he will do. Let me tell you the truth. Before Jesus Christ, I lie not. This will be the most adventurous and exciting year of your ministry on earth. That amen is not good enough. That amen is not good enough. All the places where you have been broken, battered, betrayed, wounded, people have done you. Some of you are so weak. Some of you are so discouraged. You've tried and tried. It's like it's not working. Some of us here, things have been so rough. So rough that if there was an option, you will abandon the ministry and run away. There are people that if they have somebody to give their ministry to, they will give him an escape. It's like the thing is unbearable. But I hear Jesus say, as you announce to you, the days of stress are over. There remained a rest for the people of God. Hear me, I declare to you from this day, you will experience the rest of God. You will experience the rest of God. In your ministry, you will experience the rest of God. Can somebody shout at him like thunder? Lay hands on your head and speak rest. Speak rest. Speak rest. Speak rest over your life. Speak rest over your ministry. Speak rest over your destiny. Speak rest over the call of God on your life. Speak rest over your assignment and your mandate. Speak rest. Speak rest. Speak rest. Speak rest. Speak rest. Egamo Shakola Namaha. Speak rest. Buja Dagama. Kudama Gode. Hey! Speak rest. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. If you believe it, let me hear a final amen on that rest. Please sit and go back to 2 Corinthians. Let me round up this session. Chapter 3, where we are. Verse number 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart till today. Next verse. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. When the heart of a man will abandon Moses... And turn to the Lord. When your heart will forsake Moses, when you make up your mind to keep the old covenant where God kept it, and turn to Jesus and turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The moment you forsake Moses and turn to Christ, the veil goes. And the moment the veil goes, the word comes alive. Next verse. Now the Lord is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit. The New Testament is a spirit testament. It's not a later testament. The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Somebody shout liberty. That's the liberty of sonship. You see that? There's liberty of sonship. Then he now says something that excites me in verse 18. But we all, how many of us? With open face. Why open face? Because the veil has been taken. Why is the veil taken? We have left Moses and we have turned to the Lord. Hey, with the open face. Beholding as in a glass. 
the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image that we behold and the experience is from glory to glory. Stop there. It is not from glory to glory to glory to glory. That is lazy study. It is from glory to to glory. What is that? From the glory of Moses to the glory of Jesus. There's no other glory. He says from the glory of Moses to the glory of Jesus and this glory of Jesus is even as by the spirit of the Lord. But our heart must turn. Our heart must turn. If our heart doesn't turn, this glory of Jesus will not be made manifest. Remember, this is all about Jesus. From everything I have taught here, is, is Jesus is the message. There's no other message outside Jesus. Somebody asked me, if I start preaching Jesus, wouldn't I run out of material? I told him, you cannot run out of material. This world will finish ten times you have not exhausted Jesus. Ten times the world will finish. Ten times over. You have not exhausted Jesus. And if you can't find something to preach about Jesus, it's because you don't know him. When you know him, there will be too much to say about him. In Acts chapter 5 verse 42, put it up for me. And daily, how many times? Daily in the temple. And in every house. They cease not to teach and preach what? That was the message. And they were preaching him every day. Every day. When they gather, Jesus. When they gather, Jesus. And they never exhausted it. It was daily. We don't have daily churches nowadays. These people are meeting every day. And the meeting was not just in church. They met from house to house. And they only had one message. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That was the message of the apostolic church. That should be the message of the church today. Because we are dispensing Christ able ministers of the new testament not of the later the later kill it but of the spirit the spirit give it life the ministration of death written in stones the ministration of the spirit the lord is that spirit friends there is a shift globally jesus is taking back the church see when you preach jesus you lose relevance. No preacher of Jesus remains relevant. But when you preach the law, you are relevant. The law makes you the center of attraction. The New Testament takes you out. Because you are only important because you are in Christ. The main guy in the New Testament is Christ. You only share in it by being in him. If you are not in him, you can't share in his glory. And it's time to revisit certain things we have taught. It's time. You know, some people preach heaven at last. Heaven at last is not a message. It's actually a distraction. You didn't hear me. It's not a mistake. I said it. I want to repeat it. Heaven at last is not a message. It's a distraction. If your target is to make heaven, you have missed Jesus. What makes heaven heaven is Jesus. If Jesus is not in heaven, I don't want to go there. Jesus is the light of heaven. It is Jesus that makes heaven to shine. Eh? Listen carefully. Can I say something? Jesus and heaven, which is more important? Eh? Hey, hey. So how can heaven be your goal? Are you thinking upside down? Let me ask again so that we are sure of what we said. Jesus and heaven, which is more important? Are you sure? Can I hear you shouting louder? Some people are not sure. Let's think again. I'm going to ask one more time. <laughs> my heavenly home, my beautiful. What makes it beautiful is Jesus home. Let me tell you something else. God doesn't live in heaven. Amen. 
God doesn't live in heaven. Somebody says, how? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> no, we need to settle some matter. We're men of God. Everybody read with me very loud. Want to go. In the beginning, when did God create heaven and earth? So there was a day when God created heaven and earth. There was a day a certain day when God created heaven and earth. So, before he created heaven and earth on that day, where was he? Wherever he was, that is where he is. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. The Bible calls God the immortality that dwelleth in unapproachable light, which no man has seen, nor will ever see. What are you talking about? Sit down, let's talk. This thing is bubbling now. I'm teaching to you. I'm teaching. So therefore. If heaven was created on a certain day and earth, that means earth and heaven is for man. It's not for God. Whatever God created, he created it for man, not for himself. He doesn't need earth and heaven. I'm teaching here. He doesn't need earth and heaven. Earth and heaven is for man. That's why even now, the person sitting on the throne in heaven is a man. He is called the man Jesus. Which man? What is he called? The man. The man. The man. I've just been teaching in the last few weeks in our church here on the humanity of Jesus. Because let me tell you, if you don't believe that Jesus is a man, you are not born of God. That's what the Bible says. If you don't believe that Jesus is a man right now, you are not born again. It's a fundamental issue. If you don't believe that God is a man right now, you are not born again. Because Jesus is a man. There is a mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus. The man. When he died and rose, he entered the grave and took his body so he can be a man. Because a man is spirit, soul, and body. He took his body and left the napkin. He went to heaven bodily and came back bodily and went back bodily. As a man, when he rose from the dead, they were afraid. After he came back, he asked them, Do you have fish? They gave him fish. He ate. That means he went to the toilet. Because if you eat fish, it must be digested and you must go to the toilet. Then he told them, Handle me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones. And they held him. What is bone for structure? That means he had a structure. He was still walking normal. In the glorified body. And with that body, he's still sitting in heaven now as a man. Let me give you something else. Listen, let me give you something else. How many of you know when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the sin of Adam corrupted heaven? Heaven was polluted by the fall of Adam because heaven and earth is for man. The sin of Adam polluted heaven. That's why when Jesus rose and went to heaven, he had to wash it. So it is Jesus that made heaven clean. And Jesus is the light of that city. Yes, sir. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you hearing me? Now, let me tell you something that will cause commotion here. That same Jesus that makes heaven, heaven lives inside you. He's living inside you. I will live in them. I will walk in them. They shall be my people. I will be their God. So if Jesus that makes heaven, heaven lives inside you, is heaven a goal anymore? Good. So now your prayer is not to make heaven. Your prayer is to see Jesus more. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Glory to God. Glory to God. Wave your hands and shout, Thank you, Jesus. When you understand these realities, you come to a place called the assurance of salvation. 
You're no more afraid that you may not make it. No, Jesus clearly told us, he that believeth is not condemned. He told us. Eh? And he said he has passed from death to life. And he clearly told us, he that believeth not is condemned already. Do you believe? Yeah. Heaven is your portion. Listen. Kebado gabada. Ege mojaga. First John. This is the record that we have eternal life. And that life is in his son. And he that has the son has life. We do not preach cloudy messages. We do not preach with ambiguity. We preach precise. But you see, you must see Jesus to be able to preach. If you don't see Jesus, you're just a, you're just a professional preacher. Yes. And that day is gone. That day is gone. These are the days where God is doing a quick work in his church and God is fixing his church and God is working on his people to perfect whatever he already started. And he will perfect it. Because it is his responsibility to perfect. Amen? Are we excited? 2016, I'm telling you by Jesus, you will, you will have the best year of ministry. Thank you, Lord. Are you blessed? Please stand on your feet, hug somebody and tell him congratulations. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. This is a new day. Tell somebody this is a new day. This is a new dawn. We're going to do this ministry without sweat and without effort. He is the one at work. God at work. God at work. God at work. Hallelujah. I say God at work. I say God at work. Lift your right hand and shout, my sufficiency is of God. Can I hear you shout, this year, I will function in total sufficiency. I am an able minister of the New Testament. My assignment is to dispense the New Testament. I am able. I am able. He made me able. I'm not struggling. I'm not confused. I'm not lost. I am able. Amen. Can we lift our hands like men of God and blast in tongues for two, three minutes? Let's just blast in tongues here. Let's just pray in the Holy Ghost. 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 Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Mengra nangongongri nangangange. Hele boja kende le bohada. Brosa kele de moha. Grendengo jokobo le namange. Hele bora kote na gagagara. Hele boja kende le mohonda. Membra lo boro koto me genanga. Hele mano kere nanga. Hele boja kere dega. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Build up your most holy faith. Rise up like an edifice. Higher and higher. Look at the year 2016. And pray in the Holy Ghost over the year. Pray in the Holy Ghost over this year. Egemo Shaka. Use mysteries and speak to this year. Use mysteries. He that speaketh in tongues, speaketh unto God. In the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Ela bajota, ela mangro, egele bodanga, ega boje kele ne mosata. Brosha koko kolobo. Engala mananga galaboha. Hey, hey, hey. Wogambo zekele. Mazon tele moroko tekele de boho. 
Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. I'd like you to place your hand on somebody's shoulder. Let's agree together in this whole house that nobody here, no ministry here will be left behind. That together this year, every one of us will take off on eagle's wings. Throughout this year, it will be ministry with unusual strength, unusual exploits, and unusual revelation of Jesus. Put your hands on somebody's shoulder. Let's flow in the spirit all over the place. Let's just flow in the Holy Ghost. Let's 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 flow in the Holy Ghost. Mangro tako ba 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 boboro da ba ba bambre de ge bambro da go bo jekle na maha ne maha ne maha ne maha ne maho ko ba ne ge ga ga la bo ho Thank you Lord Hallelujah in the name of Jesus, if you believe it, can I hear a conclusive amen? amen? Let's lift our hands and give him thanks and glory and honor. Just bless him and praise him. And I want you to just begin to thank Jesus for all of his mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody shout a good amen. amen. Oh my goodness, what a class. What a class. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. There is an alignment going on in the body of Christ. Discernment is coming alive. Everything doesn't go anymore. In darkness, everything goes. But when light begins to shine, Everything doesn't go anymore. And it is the entrance of his word that brings it light. Now for those of you that have questions you want to ask, there's a phone number that has been sent to your email address when you sent an email to us. And there's an email that is on that same letter. Now, you'll try and call. I know the lines are going to jam in the next few minutes. If you try calling, your call cannot get through. Send an email. We will call you. We will call you. Send us an email with your question or with the things you want us to counsel with you on and I will personally call you and speak with you. But if you try, you can't get your call through, send an email to our email address. I'm excited about the privilege to be able to bring this word your way tonight. Spend some time praying the Holy Ghost. Go through the notes again. We're going to leave the videos on Facebook page here. Come back, listen to it again. Go through the notes again before the next class tomorrow. Go through the notes again. Read them again. Pray in the Spirit. And look at the scriptures carefully. I believe God. Something is shifting in your life. God is repositioning you for a ministry of impact. Grace abounds. Sufficiency in all things. I'm looking forward to another great moment with you tomorrow in the School of Ministry. Don't forget to join. There are other broadcasts of teachings of God's word on this same page. 6 a.m. GMT plus 1 and 12 noon GMT plus 1. Then... At 10 p.m. again, the online school comes alive. Be blessed as we expect to join with you again tomorrow. Grace abounds in Jesus' name. Amen.